First came the pronouncement of the divine revelation through the living voice. First came the pronouncement of the revelation through the living voice, and afterwards there followed the writing of the books of Holy Scripture. Here again, directed to all of us who are from this Protestant West and the Protestant mindset, listen carefully, because some of the assumptions of some Protestants are going to be totally overturned in this page right here. So first, the living voice, afterwards, the writings of the books. Divine revelation is closely connected to Holy Scripture. However, it is also distinguished from it. It is also, should be is, it is also distinguished from it. All right, so it's closely connected, but it's distinguished from it. Scripture and divine revelation. The divinely inspired Holy Scripture does not constitute revelation itself. What is it then? It's the God-built treasury in which it was deposited. So God-built treasury. That's what the Holy Scriptures are. And in that treasury is deposited revelation. It is not, however, identified revelation. Okay, The words on the page, the actual book in our hands, that is not divine revelation. That is a God-built treasury in which divine revelation is found, is revealed, is, 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 is seen, so to speak, right? So it does not identify one of those. The source of Christian truth is not some holy text or books written by human rational intellect, but the revelation of God is the uncreated energy, right? The source of Christian truth is the revelation of God, which we said just now is not the actual book. The book is the treasury of it, but it's not the actual book. It's the revelation. The source of Christian truth is the revelation of God, his uncreated energy. In other words, the uncreated energy of God, his, his own operations, actions in time and space, that is the source of divine revelation. Seems pretty simple, but yet these things have implications. Holy Scripture and Holy Tradition are not sources of divine revelation. Let me repeat that because there are not a few people who don't understand this. Holy Scripture and Holy Tradition are not sources of divine revelation. What are they? Created bearers or created records. Hipomimata is the Greek, a little difficult to translate. Created bearers, like God bearers. We talk about the saints being God bearers. Well, these are bearing God as well. Holy tradition and holy scripture, they bear God. They're not sources of it, though. Like, that's a little different, but very important. Holy Scripture is not revelation, but a word about revelation, a word regarding the revelation. At one and the same time, Scripture is the unique criterion of authentic revelation, and revelation is not limited only to Scripture. All right, so at one and the same time, Scripture is the unique criterion of authentic revelation. It's the unique criterion. You can't, without Scripture, you lose that unique criterion of authentic revelation divine revelation but revelation is not limited only to scripture of course this should be obvious to all orthodox christians it should be something that the protestant uh is challenged by i would suggest i would suppose and should seriously consider revising their obsession with the actual scriptural text without understanding it has a context and it has that context is Christ himself, his divine energies, and that happens in the body of Christ. That's the context in which you have to understand and which you you, you uh, have in order for that criterion to point to and, and to, be, to be a conduit for divine revelation. With Pentecost, revelation was fulfilled. So part of the whole economy of salvation, extension of the incarnation, of course, throughout history. Uh, we said earlier, with Christ, it's completed. But with Christ, what does that mean? It's completed. It's not with completed with His first uh, incarnation, as if He left us orphans, right? He continues with us, and He continues in the church. And He says, "I'm where two or three are gathered, I'll be with you. I'll guide you in all truth." He came. He said, "His Holy Spirit." He was present, of course, at the Holy Trinity. All was on the day of Pentecost, and He is continuing with the church, and He will be there. And of course, at a second coming. All will be fulfilled. So it's not a contradiction to say that with Christ everything was complete, and yet with Pentecost revelation was fulfilled because 
there's no distinction, there's no dichotomy there. The Holy Spirit, during its lighting upon the disciples, in other words, epiphytesi in Greek, which is coming down on the Holy Apostles, on the day of Pentecost, did not reveal new dogmas. All right, so on the day of Pentecost, we didn't have new dogmas revealed. Very important because some people think, for instance, that at the ecumenical councils, new dogmas are, are, are thought up and revealed to people. Like there could be a new dogma such as the infallibility of the Pope that nobody's ever talked about. Not possible. There were not even new dogmas on the day of Pentecost. What happened on the day of Pentecost? Enlightened the, the Holy Spirit enlightened the disciples to go deeper and to understand the words of Christ, what had already been given. The Holy Spirit now gives the ability for them to remember, to understand, and to preach the presence of the Holy Spirit. That is one very basic thing that happened. But new dogmas were not preached, and they have never been preached. There's never been a new dogma preached. There's only been dogmas, in other words, the experience of the revelation, confirmed and further explained and the boundaries set so that everyone knows exactly what is meant and what's been passed down. It's all been passed down from the beginning. Once delivered the faith, not twice, not three times, not at every ecumenical council, not at Pentecost again, once delivered the faith from Christ to the, to the apostles. <coughs> the revelation, which was given by Jesus, while being of itself complete, is, however, insufficient vis-a-vis the final eschatological revelation of the second coming. This is very interesting. And I have to confess that this is the first time I think I've read this. And it's very provo provocative. Listen to what he says and don't misunderstand. The revelation which was given by Jesus while being of itself complete is, however, insufficient. Atelis is the Greek, I think. Atelis is maybe imperfect or insufficient. Uh, Eparchis, maybe, maybe it was Eparchis, I don't remember. Uh, insufficient vis-a-vis, -vis, in other words, with relate, related to, not insufficient of itself, but insufficient as it relates to what? The final eschatological revelation of the second coming. So again, you might say, well, are we contradicting ourselves? We said that with Pentecost was fulfilled, we said with the coming of Christ, it was complete. No, because this is one and the same economy, one and the same revelation, one of the same continuous present of Christ. He didn't abandon us. We don't need to recreate the church. We don't need to think second and third time about the dogmas. He's constantly present. And now we're going to see that with regard to the final eschatological revelation of the second coming, when the Son of Man will be revealed in his glory, well, this revelation is yet to be, is insufficient. It's not quite totally given, obviously. The second coming, we're going to have that uh, event which has yet to happen so it's still still we're still waiting for it right the, the the new testament then although much fuller than the old will nonetheless have the same fate if its teachings is compared to the future teaching and it will be abolished as soon as that will be implemented that's saint john chrysostom talk i'll have to get the quote for you i don't have it i can find it here if, you, if somebody's interested ever here let me read that again. The New Testament, although much fuller than the Old, obviously, right? We have a completion of the incarnation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, uh, of the Logos in and the Trinity in Jesus Christ. Nonetheless, and this is mind-boggling, its teaching is when it's compared, if it's compared to the future teaching, in other words, what will be given to us at the second coming, it will be abolished as soon as that will be implemented. So the, the, the new heaven and the earth and the eternal kingdom is going to come and, and take place of all the economy of salvation given to us for our salvation now between the first and the second coming. Now, it says in Corinthians, we know in part. Now we know in part. And we see through a glass darkly. When, however, that which is perfect is come in the future age, that is, then that which is in part shall be done away. And then we shall see clearly and manifestly Christ in his full glory face to face. So that gives you an insight into what the difference is and how what we see now in part will then see clearly pointing to the second coming. <laughs>